Welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom rivett Karnak. I'm still Christiana Figueres. You're still Dame Christiana Figueres and I'm Paul Dickinson. <laughs> this week we talk about the war in Ukraine and the effect it's having on energy policy and global pacts ahead of COP27. We speak to Kings Mill Bond from the Rocky Mountain Institute and we have music from Stelios Vasiludis. Thanks for being here. So following last week's episode, when we dove into the issue of US federal policy and how it's unfolding at this critical moment, this week we're going to take a look at the global situation. Now, if you cast your mind back a few months to prior to the negotiations in Glasgow, there were some big deals that came out. But one of the most significant was an $8.5 billion pledge that was pulled together by various governments around the world, including the UK, the US and the European Union, to support South Africa's move away from fossil fuels. Now, this precipitated a very significant breakthrough because South Africa has been a consistent user of coal. And this deal, although it still needs to be implemented, heralded the beginning of a very significant transformation that was echoed around the world. Now, ahead of COP27, we're seeing various governments thinking about what they can do for other critical countries. What about Indonesia? What about India? What about Brazil? Those are difficult deals to pull together. And they're being made more difficult by the fact that the war in Ukraine is leading to a rise in energy prices that in turn is actually now leading to an increase in coal usage just at the moment when we need to see it come right down. So that's the topic we're going to delve into this week. It's not going to be the only week we talk about these big global climate Uh, energy deals between countries because they're going to be a big important part of the rest of the year but we're going to make a start this year so which of you would like to dive in with some thoughts on this that's so unfair i thought you were going to go first (laughs) okay 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 okay. christiana so tom i believe and i'm in fact delighted to be wrong but i believe that the support for south africa is um, sort of generally called to help them transition out of fossil fuels, but I believe it actually is focused on coal, Correct. exiting coal. And I believe that the support that the EU principally um, is be- and, and the United States are in discussion of with Indonesia, India, and Vietnam is also about coal. So why why are we prioritizing coal over... Uh, let's call it liquid fossil fuels. We're prioritizing coal because it is the most carbon intensive. And it is, of all of the fossil fuels, the first one that needs to exit the energy system ASAP. So that is why there is, that is why, let's say from a carbon emissions perspective, there's a focus on coal. The the reason, uh, in addition to that, the political reason why there is a conversation ongoing is because developed countries had promised the famous hundred billion support to developing countries and never delivered it. And developing countries quite rightly are saying, well, if you don't support us for the transition, how are we ever going to transition out of fossil fuels, especially out of coal? So that is why these countries that are some of the most heavily dependent and most emitting because of their coal um, and because of their coal exports, that's why they're being prioritized, right? So South Africa, Indonesia, India, and Vietnam. Um, Now, what I think is fascinating is the aspiration that is certainly embedded in the South African commitment, which is still being discussed on how it's actually going to be implemented. But the aspiration is not just to give uh, some money to South Africa, but rather to have it be a support that will embed a just transition. And I think this is really, really important for, for two reasons. A, because just from a political reason, unless those industries and communities that have been dependent on coal production uh, for decades are supported, it's very difficult for them to uh, to just let go of one branch, so to speak, without having somewhere else to land. 
Um, but it also really goes to the morality of this. Because to expect a developing country or a small community or a utility to just move away from what it has been doing because it's good for the planet, in addition to being good for the country itself, um, it is just not morally correct. So both from a political perspective as well as from a moral perspective, this financing is really being very aspirational in what it is trying to do. And the big question, of course, is whether this is going to be able to be finalized, certainly the South African one, but also how far will they come in the negotiations with Indonesia, India, and Vietnam before COP27. And fascinating that these conversations continue despite the Ukrainian war, despite the money that is being put into everything to do with military uh ramp up and support of the Ukraine, and despite the crazy fossil fuel prices, which um, as we have been taught, and listeners will have a fantastic lesson from Kinsey mm -hmm, Mufon, mm -hmm. but it is, you know, these crazy fossil fuel prices um, are, to see them as being beneficial is to see the world only from the producer perspective or logic and not from the consumer logic. Because the producers, South Africa, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam, of course, will say, wait, 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 you know, this is the moment to cash in. We're getting such huge prices for this stuff, this contaminating stuff. And consumer mentality is exactly the opposite. There is so much anger at the pump. There is so much anger at having to pay these crazy prices for, for fossil fuels that um, consumers are hopefully getting more and more outraged, to use a word that we know a little bit about. Mm. That's a brilliant summary, Christiana. And look, isn't it great that actually the South Africa deal and these other deals uh, show that, you know, the sort of richer nations, OECD, whatever you want to call them, they're, they're actually coming forward with real cash now because everything else is kind of rubbish. You know, you actually need real money uh, to do this. But I, I'm, I mean... You know, COVID demonstrated that there's, you know, there is a magic money money purse that can be opened up when you need it. Um, secondarily, I think COVID and then the Ukrainian invasion both demonstrate our sense of vulnerability, and people kind of get it. Like, okay, you know, we're vulnerable, and we've got to be, we've got to do grown up things like look after our security, which includes making deals to take out coal. But just one other thing, I mean, these these conversations, these negotiations, I'm sure they are complex for the reasons you described. But there's a whole issue here, right, in the world right now, which is about capital expenditure on fossil fuels and we've discussed this before you know it, and it's a pure i think it's a pure risk management issue you know there are problems with fossil fuels it could be putin or it could be the carbon border adjustment mechanisms that are definitely coming in the eu or whatever but people have always kind of criticized uh renewables they say oh they're intermittent or whatever you know the wind doesn't blow or sun doesn't shine or something but fossil fuels are unreliable this is what we're learning and and i think that that you know, this is this is an opportunity for us to kind of sort of say, all right, you know, when we shift out of fossil fuels, when we use this unique moment to to replace them with renewables, then we can get ourselves out of that intermittency and into stable long term energy provision. And that's what we need to do. Yeah. So I agree with all of that. I think just I mean, the, the point, I suppose, would be that in a way we've been supported over the last few years by the fact that coal has been increasingly uneconomic. Right, it's been the more economic solution, certainly to produce renewables, but also gas has been cheaper than coal in most places around the world. Now, the intersection of this issue with the Ukraine crisis is that it's come down a bit now, but it wasn't long ago that gas prices were at three hundred and thirty-five euros per megawatt hour, which was an enormous increase on where they were before. As a result of that, it increasingly became more cost-effective to burn coal even if you had to pay a levy on top of that because you knew it was polluting. Now, that is leading, according to the conversations that I've been having with people who are very well versed on what's happening in Indonesia, what's happening to India, to an understandable reluctance to do any kind of deal on the table. Because if you're doing a deal about closing down an industry that you think is sort of dying anyway, then that's one set of political considerations. But if you're thinking about doing a deal 
around an industry that's looking increasingly lucrative, then as you say, Christiana, if you're running a country with lots of people in poverty, then you start to think, is this really a good idea for my country? So yeah. I suppose the concern here is, and it's, you know, we're sort of admiring the problem rather than solving it at the moment, is that these deals are hard to do at the best of times. And the South Africa deal, impressive though it was, it got a lot of holes in it, right? A lot of that 8.5 billion is pledged. It hasn't been delivered yet, et cetera it's going to be orders of magnitude and orders orders of magnitude more complicated and orders of magnitude more expensive to do it in big economies like Indonesia and India. Do we think we have the political will after everything's been going on in Ukraine to still push that through? No, exactly. And, and you know, the, the conundrum there is um, that, the you know, what, what Kingsmill later on will so brilliantly say, the the consumer mentality versus the producer mentality. So if you have coal to mine and export, then of course you are in the producer mentality and you think that you've hit a jackpot right now. Um, And this is the moment to extract and export as much coal as possible for prices probably never seen before or certainly not in a long time. Now, those who are buying the stuff are not as happy about uh, about that, and it does make renewables even more competitive with all the polluting alternatives. So 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 there you are, right? The the choice here is do we go with the current from a producer perspective, do we go with the current, very lucrative, contaminating stuff? Because it's very tempting to do that right now. Right. Even if I know that that won't last forever. But right now, you know, I have a big dollar sign in front of me, looming in front of me. Why don't I go for that? And so it makes these deals, these, you know, exit deals, let's call them, with those countries much more difficult because the the alternative for them at least short term is looking very lucrative okay so i've got a i've got a challenge here for the oil and gas industry if i may um bp themselves just announced these incredible profits best for 10 years and they're saying that they're going to spend another 2.5 billion dollars buying their own shares now i'm sorry but you know if this is a police investigation BP would be called a company of interest. They say, we have a person of interest. BP is a company of interest. There it is, with a whole bunch of capability and logistics, possibly able to get people off coal in the short term whilst building the transitions. And then they're buying two and a half billion dollars of their own shares. I think this is a, a moment where we all have to get kind of serious about taking coal out. And that needs governments and political will, just as you said, Christiana. But it also needs technology and, and companies to help with interim as well as long-term solutions. But Paul, what does short-term infrastructure look like? Um, plastic rubber hoses instead of metal pipes. I'm being a slightly silly, but I'm saying, in a sense, you know, you've got basically a whole bunch of power demand, and you know, let's say it's being fed with coal, and it's going to be fed with renewables. I mean, maybe you just have to put the renewables in faster. Maybe that's it. Forget my short term. But I'm, but I'm trying to do is I'm kind of offer up the idea that there's a role here. Uh, and, and and you know, we, we've just got to stop using coal, and it's very simple. Hmm. Uh, can I ask why? We should go to the interview with Kingsman in a minute because he's very thoughtful on this, and I think it would he be is. good to do that then come back. I just had a question for you, Paul. I saw that $2.5 billion uh, worth of buyback, and it struck me that that is – BP, obviously not saying this, but sort of basically slowly winding itself down and returning itself to its shareholders. That, that's not necessarily wrong. Um, that's not necessarily wrong at all. And actually, I would encourage shareholders to sort of uh, pay pay bonuses to to company directors of, of oil and gas companies who who do not spend that money uh, on, on exploration, but new instead oil and gas infrastructure, but instead back. return it to the shareholders. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that that's what everybody wants, quite frankly. And the, and the shareholders will then have this cash that they can then deploy in super rapid renewables. Because it's interesting. So, cause yes, you're, you're right in that regard. I heard the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, on the Today programme in the UK this morning, and they were hammering him saying, well, you know, you can't tax windfall profits because this money is needed by pensioners who have invested all, I mean, it's a spurious argument, right? Invested all their money into BP, so therefore they need the stock price to rise. But actually, if you were to 
liquidate those companies over a 10-year period and return the money to shareholders, then that would be a win-win situation in many ways, would it not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and people don't have to have their pensions stuck in Kodak. And no. They all have to keep using, <laughs> you know, film when digital cameras are better. You know, the world changes. That's true. Right. Kingsmill Bond. Okay, so um, just a word of caution here. We are introduced to not only Kingsmill Bond here, but also... <laughs> A sort of slightly oily and unpleasant character that Paul Dickinson decided to inhabit. Yes, for some yes. reason. So, so just yeah, bear you with can us. Say unpleasant, but realistic. I would call it realistic. It'll be over soon, listeners. So just bear with us. Um, but anyway, Kingsmore Bond is a senior principal at the Rocky Mountain Institute RMI. It's a non-profit. He is a thought leader on global clean energy. Uh, he's an energy strategist, and he writes on the energy transition narrative. Um, he's had a long career in the financial sector. And he really interested us recently with a piece that he wrote that basically made the case that the invasion of Ukraine heralded the end of fossil fuels. Mm. And we wanted to, it'll be in the show notes, we wanted to basically take him to task about that and find out if we agree with him. Um, it's very good. You'll, you'll be impressed with this. Here's Kingsmill Bond. We'll be back afterwards for some more analysis. Kingsmill, thank you so much for joining us here on Outrage and Optimism. Um, and Kingsmill, you know, I have very often reached out to you when I have a difficult conversation or presentation um, because I so respect the analysis that you do of the global energy system. However, I really wonder, Kingsmill, if at this point you are not... How should I say this? You are not in la-la land because I would love to believe that everything that we're seeing now is actually going to accelerate us into mm. decarbonizing our economy and into investing even more into renewable energy. But is that wishful thinking or is that actually accurate reading of the crystal ball? Because we have Ukraine, we have inflation, and we have midterm elections coming up in the United States all at the same time. And of course, we have a sort of underlying commitment to decarbonization. But how is Ukraine inflation and midterm elections, how is that very dangerous triangle actually going to help us to accelerate decarbonization? First of all, thank you, uh, Christiana, for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So, so the question is, are we, or am I in la-la land uh, by imagining that uh, we are indeed on track in this energy transition? And you were right to say that if it were politics alone that were driving this energy transition, uh, things would indeed look quite bleak. Uh, however, the primary driver of change here, as of course anywhere with transitions, is, is economics. Um, and, and of course, uh, if I take your trifecta of, of problems, the midterm elections in the US, inflation and Ukraine, the, the thing that really stands out is Putin's war and Putin's war, which has driven um, a spectacular increase in the cost of fossil fuels. And after that, I mean, really, it's just pretty simple. High prices drives a reaction, just the same as we saw in the 1970s with the oil price shocks. People scrambled around initially to try and find any other solution. All kinds of weird uh, devices and rationing were tried in the 1970s, but they eventually landed upon the only solution, which is the solution that, that we are now embracing, will embrace, uh, which is uh, efficiency and faster deployment of uh, new energy technologies. So this, I guess, is the reason for my, uh, in spite of the, the horror of Ukraine, uh, is the reason for my optimism about the energy transition is that we must and we are doing uh, efficiency and, uh, and and renewables deployment. But Kingsmill, mm. doesn't that really depend on who gets blamed for the high prices? If, you know, if, if Putin's war and horrors in Ukraine are correctly blamed for uh, the high prices, well, then you have one set of actions. But 
if others get blamed, if renewable energy gets blamed or if Biden gets blamed. And, you know, we we saw yesterday and I know both uh, Tom and Paul want to jump on this. These amazing stickers that are being placed on pumps, gas pumps and, and fuel pumps in the United States with a, a bumper sticker with Biden's face pointing to the cost of filling up your gas tank in your car. And, you know, the obnoxious statement, Biden did this. Now, if Biden is blamed for increasing prices, well, then that has a huge political consequence that is going to curtail Biden's possibility to pass a bill to and to do any um, any investment, certainly from the public sector into renewable energy, batteries, grids, et cetera, et cetera, everything that is necessary, and certainly nothing that would incentivize the private sector from investing. So has the oil and gas sector won this battle? So, um, Christiana, I think you might be um, getting a little bit in, too in- enthusiastic about this. Look, at the end of the day, um, about this the, this argument, at the end of the day, you have as many bi- um, bumper stickers as you like. Um, if, if you want to go out there and and um, and fill up your gas tank at four, four, four bucks a gallon, um, or alternatively get an EV and fill up for, you know, 20 cents per gallon, whatever it is, you know, it's... It, it's just it's just economics, not um, not not politics and blame. So I, I don't I don't think you know this is this catches headlines. I don't think it's terribly relevant or significant. Um, I mean, the other point, Timmy, is of course, with all due respect, the United States is not the world. Um, you know, there are plenty of other countries which are facing, of course, similar dynamics of of high prices, and and it's high price, of course, which is which which drives change. So one of the key points that I would make is that before. This this shock, according to BNF, as you know, ninety one percent of the world renewable electricity was the cheapest source of of new uh, new electricity. You know, after after the war and the shock and the price increases of fossil fuels, it's basically everywhere. And and furthermore, there's a whole series of additional tipping points right across the energy spectrum where um, the cost of renewable energy solutions are now. We, we didn't think they were going to be cheaper than fossil fuels until the the second half of this decade, and they're already cheaper. Uh, green steel, but... green ammonia, right across the board, those tipping points are materialising much faster. King's Mill, King's Mill, how I want to agree with you, but Christiana has, <laughs> Dame Christiana, Dame Christiana Figueres has given me the, and, and Tom the opportunity today to play the kind of person who's constantly <laughs> I'm trying to argue with and I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to it. Kingsville, <laughs> you undermine your own argument, don't you? Think about it for a minute. Be realistic. Be realistic, Kingsville. Surely the higher prices for oil and gas make the business case to drill more oil and gas. And indeed, was it not President Biden, your democratic president, if you will, who used to talk about climate change, he himself now is, is encouraging the oil and gas industry. To drill, so surely now you must appreciate that these issues of energy independence. It's must really hard to listen your, to this. Your tone, temporary <laughs> concerns yeah. about climate change. Be realistic, Kingswell. <laughs> Give me an answer to the energy pa- price crunch when there's such a good business case for drilling now. Pa- Paul, I have to say, it does not become you, but that's all right. <laughs> so, so kind of you, Paul, to introduce this. The um, the the uh, if I may, this is a a, a, a simple failure of logic. Your your this is producer logic. Um, versus rather than consumer logic, uh, just because it costs a producer more money to produce something and therefore they get very excited and go and produce more of it doesn't mean that you as a consumer are actually <laughs> going to use the stuff. Um, and, and that's the absolutely key point, the, the key error, in fact, that the fossil fuel industry and its backers is making right across the board right now, which, which is that when you get a supply shock and you get artificially high prices for a um, as, as a result of that sh- shock, sure, um, it, it's profitable to, to to drill on a temporary basis, but they're forgetting the damage that it's doing to consumption, and it's consumption ultimately, you know, in our, in our society, which 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 um, which has the power. And I will remind you, of course, that in the 1970s, when we had the two oil shocks um, in 1973 and 1979, you know, it was fabulous for the oil producers for a while, um, but then. Um, 
uh, we had a massive increase in efficiency. We had a massive um, ramp up of the exciting new technology at the time, which was nuclear. Um, and, and as a result of those, um, ultimately, the, uh, the fossil fuel industry sowed the seeds of its own demise. Because, um, in fact, as you know, in the 1980s, uh, demand stagnated uh, as a result of those two factors. And, and of course, ultimately, that was a factor in the uh, in the failure and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, you know, be careful what you wish for, I suppose, in the fossil fuel sector. Artificially um, high prices are not good for the industry. Uh, let me do, let me ask one more follow up, because in this character, I can't tell you how much I enjoy the. Um, so it has been suggested, not least by people that, that are not a million no, miles away. No, but wait, away. Paul, you have to put on your character voice. Also. Okay, okay. Th- thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Just King's Mill, King's Mill, King's Mill. <laughs> Surely we've played into Putin's trap here. I mean, do you think that he might conceivably have started this terrible invasion? And I don't wish to make light of something so serious, but could he not have made started this invasion to create an oil crisis, to to create a sudden uh, 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 new wave of investment in fossil fuels, thereby to sort of lock us in? Because if I'm not mistaken, if we if we do reduce at seven percent a year between now and 2030 or or afterwards, then the Russian economy, you know, very much dependent upon export income from oil and gas, is in terrible trouble. So might this not be a, a, a geopolitical action? And surely Biden begging big oil to drill is, is means that we're falling into Putin's trap. So uh, I, I'm very impressed at your insights into Putin's mind, uh, Paul. And, um, <laughs> we think alike on many things, actually. <laughs> it's an extraordinarily cunning plan to, to get defeated at the gates of Kiev and, and turn what was meant to be a quick war into an extremely long extended one with very wide long-term ramifications. Um, that, that may have been his cunning plan, but, was, but uh, slightly the logic slightly beyond me. No, I mean, clearly it was an attempt at a lightning war like Crimea and it's failed and it's created this kind of mess that we have to deal with. But um, I think the really, the other important point and, uh, uh, that needs to be stressed is that it is of course at times of stress that you do things that you struggled to do before. Um, so right across the world, the technology problems have been solved, the economics problems have been solved for the deployment of renewable energies and technologies at scale. But everywhere they face um, incumbents and inertia and laws and, and, and systems tailored for the fossil fuel era. So now, in fact, is precisely the moment that we um, we can use to, to, to as it were, um, destroy and, and and make a bonfire of, of all these old technologies and, and regulations. And, and, and actually, it is through crisis that you can drive change. So I would suggest, in fact, that Putin has um, set in train the very transition that he was uh, seeking, perhaps, to avoid. Hmm. Kingsmill, can I ask you a couple of questions? So this is really interesting, and, and I have to confess, I do agree with you on most things. But there's one thing which you said earlier that I'd like to just pick up on. And you said this is not to do with politics, to do with economics. And so I'd like to just explore the intersection between those two, because, of course, economics and politics are so fundamentally interlinked. And to go back to the examples you've given of the 1970s, um, which, of course, did lead to this efficiency boom, it also led to the collapse of confidence in the Carter administration and 10 years of 12 years of Republican rule that led to deregulation and more drilling and other things. So do you not think as we enter into this period where prices are prices go up as a result of this geopolitical stress, that leads to political squeezes. It's very difficult to know what happens once the politics starts being as volatile as that. And you start ending up with a situation where the political manifestation of an economic sort of like um, lack of stability will create this sort of bumpy top of demand where nobody really knows what's going on. So legislative swing back and forth and people come in and take advantage of the politics of fear to try and take advantage of this. So I'm just I'm interested in your analysis of how the economics of this and the politics of this intersect because it could become very messy in that interaction. Well, on this, on this Tom, I do, I do actually agree with you. It is going to be bumpy. I mean, we have a, a, a kind of peak plateau decline framing for the fossil fuel system. And as you say, the plateau is going to be bumpy. It's going to be very stressful at the top. This, of course, is one of the reasons um, why RMI and, and indeed yourselves, Outrage and Optimism, it, how important it is for, for us all to, to, to uh, set out what can be achieved in, in very clear terms and uh, set out the great advantages, of course, for the peoples of the world of having domestically produced cheap local energy. 
um, in order to avoid demagoguery, you know, leaping upon this and seeking to uh, reverse the changes. And, and I think that was the other point I would I, I really want to make, which is that um, it, here we are kind of at the end of or the peak of the fossil fuel era where we're struggling to get enough stuff out of the ground and we're destroying the planet and it's very stressful, it's very expensive and it's very damaging. And, and yet we, of course, have this extraordinary um, uh, resource of solar and wind, which we've unlocked over the last five years, which is now 100 times bigger. It's distributed across the world. It's profoundly democratic. Um, I mean, I don't want to sound too optimistic, as it were, um, but it is nevertheless a um, a very powerful rallying cry, I think, for the, the forces of change and justice and opportunity and growth. Yeah. And I mean, the piece in your, one of the pieces in your article that really struck me was just about the fact that the growth in solar and wind is absorbing the vast majority of the growth in energy demand. And actually, I know much of my family works in oil and gas, actually. So I remember long conversations about the over the dinner table over the difference between, you know, a million barrels a day supply being and compared to demand. If the demand drops below the supply by even a million barrels a day, you end up with a massive price drop. And actually, you can end up in a permanent situation of that type. So I, I was very interested by that analysis. But let's just go one level deeper in, in the manifestation of this in the world. I mean, I agree with you that this, this is the opportunity for us to go big in these solutions, but we're not really seeing political leaders capture that opportunity, right? With the exception of maybe Sadiq Khan or Gavin Newsom, Biden is falling away from this, not talking about any more. The, you know, the backbenchers of the Tory party seem to have the prime minister in the UK on the run of saying you need to abandon net zero and embrace deregulation. The politicians are not showing the backbone that's going to be necessary yet to take advantage of the opportunity that you're highlighting is my fear about this moment. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, living as I do in the UK with our somewhat uninspiring government, uh, I, I can't disagree with you that we haven't yet <laughs> Um, uh, stepped up to the plate with uh, solutions. But uh, don't forget, it's early days. And inevitably, an, an extended period of high fossil fuel prices um, will, will uh, mean that certain slightly more sensible uh, people will, will obviously embrace um, e efficiency gains and will remove some of the barriers to the deployment of renewables at scale. And I want to come back, if I may, to this point about size, just you know, for your listeners, just to articulate how close we are um, or were even before the crisis to the peak of the fossil fuel era. I think it is quite quite significant because, um, of course, once you reach the top and, and, and enter the new paradigm of, of, of decline down the other side, it's a very, very different world. So I, I'm going to attempt something, I guess, um, what I shouldn't really do, which is play with numbers on air. But anyway, it's quite simple. Um, global energy demand growth uh, before the crisis was, was running at about 1%. And the Solar and wind were about 5% of the system, and, and they were growing at about 15%. So 15, 5, 75 basis points, 75% of the growth in a steady state environment was already coming from this new disruptive uh, technology of solar and wind. Add in hydro, nuclear, and biomass, and basically there was very little space for fossil fuel uh, demand growth. Now, if you go to the new world where fossil fuel prices are significantly higher, you don't have to tweak your models very much. I mean, slightly higher solar and wind growth, um, take it up to 20%, 20 times five, that's one. You've already got all of your growth. And then, of course, the growth itself is going to be lower because GDP is damaged by the energy shock. And you're going to have, um, a, a, at the margin, improved gains on efficiency. So, you know, we just play with the numbers and, and we said, well, look, this was a structural shift that was happening anyway, brought forward by the cyclical shock of COVID and now really catalyzed by Putin's war. And, and, and the, the very, very simple observation that high prices drives uh, new solutions. Well, Kingsville, let me press you on that one because I get your consumer logic. I totally agree with the consumer logic and at the same time. The view on the other side to decarbonize and increase, uh, especially accelerate exponentially, which is what we must do, everything to do with renewable energy. It's not exactly a smooth ride to the world powered by renewables, you know, by tomorrow morning. At this point, we have at least three major, major squeeze points, I would say. The first squeeze point is investors. Investors are not prone to take a long-term view unless that's the way they're invested. There is a huge temptation 
to harvest current profits from absolutely absurd prices of fossil fuels now. Then we have a technology squeeze. We actually do not have the maturity of battery technology or of other storage that would support renewables being put on the grid beyond a certain percentage, which is, I think, sort of we're, we're, we're getting to that point now on the grids. And then we have the infrastructure uh, squeeze point, which is we're relying on completely outdated, inefficient grids that just, you know, are just a waste of grids because they waste so much on, um, on the efficiency of the transport that they're doing. So it's not exactly a very smooth ride from where we are now to net zero emissions energy, is it? Um, so, so, Christian, let me address those, those four points in turn, if I may. Um, if you start with the observation about exponential growth, um, and you know, if, if the argument is made we're not enjoying exponential growth, in fact, we are. I mean, just take a look at any chart of the the deployment of solar and wind um, and electric vehicles and batteries over the last five years, and you'll see an absolutely classic exponential S curve type chart of very rapid and continuous growth. And indeed, solar is still growing at 20%, wind is still growing at 10 to 15%, you know, uh, car car sales were still fairly early days, but they're still growing at over 50%, um, battery sales 100%, so on and so forth. So there's still, there is indeed actually continuous exponential growth of these technologies. And just to be clear for for a moment, um, all you have to do is get your new deployment to be renewables based and inevitably, with depreciation and time, all of the old stuff will vanish. And, and of course, we're now basically there in the electricity sector. I mean, Arena just pointed out 80% of, of new electricity deployment is, is renewables nowadays. So we're basically there in that sector. And, and, and that phenomenon is very significant. So electricity is so significant in and of itself. But anyway, sorry, answer your other questions about investors. Look, I wouldn't be quite so skeptical about investors. People recognize the difference between price spikes um, or even a few couple of years of high prices and the necessity to earn high returns over an extended periods. So even today, in fact, um, investors are putting money into, tending to put money into short-term um, opportunities in the uh, fossil fuel sector. But it is actually, um, if you want energy and you want energy quick and you want energy with high and relatively constant returns, actually much easier to deploy onshore um, onshore wind today, or put up a solar farm, then you know to do some wild, extravagant, long-term, twenty-year deployment um, of, of oil in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's it, th- there's no one actually suggesting they're going to do that. That's the other interesting point. I mean, in spite of everything so far, we haven't seen a massive surge in uh, fossil fuel capex. Which then brings me to, my, to the to the third point about the variability. So, in fact, um, and I know you're playing devil's advocate, but just to correct the numbers. We're nowhere near the ceiling of renewable electricity deployment. So the argument goes, variability is a problem. You know, we, we're running up against limits, as you say, and um, it, it, it can't be done above a certain percentage. Well, l- let us, um, first of all, examine what that percentage might be. So um, RMI's rule of thumb is that you can uh, increase the deployment of solar and wind up to around 70%. Um, of your system today without incurring significant additional costs simply by using a whole series of technologies of wider grids and uh, supply side and demand side variability um, and better forecasting and so on and and, and so forth and limited room for for some batteries in there. Um, The uh, NREL recently said up to 80%, in fact, they thought you could achieve without long-term battery storage. So that the, the, the ceiling in 2022 is called it 70 to 80. Then if you examine where the world is today, you know, it's 12% solar and wind globally. The leaders like um, Denmark or Ireland or Northern Germany or Southern Australia um, are approaching 50%. They're not running up against insoluble problems. So it really is an extremely academic debate to worry about the last 20% when we're, we're years, if not decades, away from that happy moment. And, and I think it's really important. I mean, you know, nobody would say that you shouldn't embark on life because, you know, you might face problems one day. You just got to get on with it. And there's so much opportunity before us right now. I mean, you know, the marginal 
again, to get technical, the marginal payment cost curves that people like McKinsey do just have so much, so many opportunities where you can deploy these renewable energy technologies at zero and negative cost saving money. Um, and then finally, this point about inefficient grids. Well, again, it's the, the necessity to upgrade grids is part of what we have to do as societies in, in, in every country. And, and we just have to get on with it. And I recognize there's real problems doing it, particularly in, in the US. But, you know, take a look at China. China is doing this stuff and, and putting into place these HDVC technologies, which were enable, enabling very high uh, de deployment of, of renewables in the west of the country, and then taking that energy to the east of the country. And the danger that the US faces is to be leapfrogged by China deploying all of these technologies much more successfully, much more quickly, and leading the energies of the future. So I'm waiting for a Sputnik moment where you know the Republican Party goes, gee, <laughs> we don't want to get buried by the Chinese in the same ways we didn't want didn't want to get buried by you know the Russians back in the 1950s. Wake up, guys. So, so Kingsmill, Kingsmill, I, I have to, uh, in this persona, uh, surrender. You've demolished all of the arguments that I've put forward and others, and uh, and you're essentially right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw away this rather unpleasant character I've been playing and just ask you if you could give a quick answer to the question I gave you in advance this morning. I asked you about those stickers that were going on the gas saying, you know, Biden caused these gas high gas prices. And I asked you, how could the very large and fast growing climate change community that listen to this podcast respond? What messages could we re use to, to make the opposite point? So I don't actually think we have to get into a kind of counter bumper sticker and, you know, the fossil fuel industry did this or Putin did this. The, the Putin case. did this. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, I mean, certainly you, you could look at um, in, in Europe right now, as you know, uh, again, if I stick with bumper stickers for a moment, they're using, you know, the, the World War II uh, framing. If you ride alone, you ride with Hitler kind of stuff. You ride alone, you ride with Putin. That's the uh, that's the messaging. But actually, I think there is a much more substantive point to be made here, which is that we should be using this moment to do stuff that has been difficult, to rewrite uh, laws and systems, to remove subsidies to the fossil fuel sector. And before people throw up their hands in horror, you want to be giving the subsidies to the people, and then the, the people can use um, the money where they wish to, which probably will not be on fossil fuels. And you could, of course, make that extremely just by targeting it to specific groups of people. So I think to answer your question, you know, leaving aside bumper stickers, now is the moment for us to, uh, to, to, to actually go and do the very detailed work that Boris Johnson's government doesn't seem to be particularly good at getting these technologies deployed. You know, let's, across the world, improve time of use pricing. Let us remove the legislation in the UK, which stops the deployment, uh, for example, of, of onshore wind. Uh, let us make it easier to put up uh, uh, solar panels on, on roofs and on land. Uh, let's, let's embrace this moment. Time of use pricing. Thank you, Kingsville. Well, Kingsville, can I um, please thank you for um, putting up with us today? We've been <laughs> lobbing balls at you right and left, front and center. Uh, and thank you very much for, uh, for, for really helping us think through these issues because it is it is not easy and the last thing that we want to do is actually reach simplistic conclusions so thank you very much for uh for, for humoring us and <laughs> helping us to get into much more of the complexity of this um and kingsmill as we draw to a close uh we know that you sometimes listen to our podcast so this will not come as a surprise to you that we always ask our guest uh, at the end, to tell us one thing that uh, that you are outraged about, and one thing that you're optimistic, although your whole conversation today is actually mm. about um, the optimistic view for decarbonized uh, energy. But if you could pick one thing that you're most optimistic about, perhaps you know what, perhaps in the short term, because I think long term we could all agree that you know we are going to make it, but. In the short term, in the shortest term possible, what are you most optimistic about and um, what are you most outraged that we still haven't gotten to? Well, I'm going to start with outrage. I am outraged yes. that half of the U.S. maize crop is 
being turned into incredibly inefficient ethanol, which is being used for driving in a world where whole nations are facing starvation. That was never a good idea. It was, a, it, it was an idea of 20 years ago. It doesn't work. It destroys energy and it needs to stop. And now is the moment. And if you want something very, very short term and live, and we will have to do it um, before the end of this year, I suspect. Um, on my optimism, I'm actually, if I may, there was something I didn't talk about in my optimism, which is if you just assume, as it were, business as usual, continuity, continued learning curves and, um, and growth rates, we will end up in 2030 with $20 solar, $30 wind, $1 hydrogen and $50 batteries. That's less than half of any fossil fuel equivalent. And that means that inevitably the entire system will be obliged and forced uh, to change and it and is going to unleash a huge amount of human creativity to deploy um, all of that stuff. Because if there's one thing that one can take from human history, you know, from Pete in Holland to sperm whales in the United States, you know, coal in, in the UK, was we're incredibly good at exploiting cheap energy and figuring out ways to use it. So that's my optimistic observation. Sorry, can you just say that again? One dollar hydrogen. So yeah, so, so t- twenty dollars per megawatt hour solar. So put that in context today. To, to, to generate electricity from, from coal or gas. I mean, again, prices are spiking so much, but you know, even just the variable cost of the stuff um, is going to cost you at least 50 bucks. So you know, forgetting even about the, the building of the infrastructure. Um, uh, so that's $20 per megawatt hour solar, $30 per megawatt hour wind, $100 per kilowatt hour was always the kind of holy grail for the industry. We're basically there. Um, and you don't have to be very aggressive in your extrapolation to see that we're going to get to 50 by 2030. And that just means that you're going to have EVs that are significantly cheaper than ICE cars. And you're going to have the technology deployed all over the place. Um, you know, why, why wouldn't you? When when the kind of the, the fossil fuel equivalent today, I guess, you know, we used to say 100. Well, actually, today's oil price is probably 150. Mm. Um, and, and then finally, um, hydrogen. Hydrogen, of course, being the, um, the uh, as, 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 um, as I like to say, it's, it's like Heineken, it's the technology which reaches places that other technologies can't reach. Um, and, and at $1 per kilogram, you could deploy green hydrogen in many different areas, which today um, we find it a little bit difficult. So be, a, be that um, uh, heavy transportation, be it um, pet chem, be it uh, for, for, for steel, for example, you know, that $1 hydrogen is the solvent which makes possible um, the deployment of, of uh, renewable energy uh, in, in, into those Areas. And I should say, um, sorry, also relevant to this debate, we shouldn't forget that um, we have a whole load of peaks of fossil fuels already behind us. I mean, I know we talk a lot about peaking, um, but you know, peak demand for industry for fossil fuels was 2014. It's down 5%. Peak demand of the United States for fossil fuels was 2007. In Europe, it was 2006. You know, across the OECD, we were long past the peak. And in, 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 in South America and, um, you know, it, 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 the kind of narrative that we're talking about, about a very, very fragile system um, it, approaching a, a, a peak and then declining is absolutely obvious. Sorry, Chris, Christiana, I've, I've gone a little bit too far here. <laughs> that's great. No, 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 no. No, that's that's great. And I really like that you brought the peaking in again um, here at Kingsmill because um, we, we do have the feeling that it's not a peak, right, um, that we do have sort of a series of peaks and valleys that I think you define as a plateau. And so I think that makes it difficult to understand that um, that there is a maximum reach and that there is a trajectory and a tendency downward. So um, so thanks for, for bringing that in again. Um, Kingsville, once once again, thank you so much for uh, for 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 humoring us today. <laughs> um, I think our listeners will not recognize the personas that we embodied today, but we did it quite deliberately in order to um, give you the opportunity to to dig deeper into this. So thank you very much for that. Congratulations on moving over to. RMI, I'm sure the carbon tracker is very sad to have lost you, but the good news is the climate community still counts on you. Thank you very much, Kinsman. 
Good job. Honestly, you're better at being us than us, I think. But that's a different point. Thanks a lot, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. So, what a pleasure to get to sit and chat with Kingsmill. Um, what did you both take from that conversation? I, I, I think he's super. I mean, I, you know, I really disliked it, 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 pretending to be the awful person that asked oh, you those awful questions. It. But Come you on. made such a convincing <laughs> role. You just stepped into that role so convincingly, Paul. You could have called me smug. Do I enjoy being smug? <laughs> Adopting that kind of tone of voice where I'm really sort of talking down my nose to the other person like they've not thought about this at all or have got any opinions that are valid. Yeah, maybe I enjoyed that a little bit too much, to be honest with you. But look, no, he's he's he's, he's completely nailed it. I, I super agree with him. Um, he, he actually said after the interview uh, in an email to us that um, that – he hadn't emphasised enough that COVID was a way to drive change, which I think is is, is really true. Um, let's not make the mistake again, he said. But particularly, he, he said, and I, and I would echo this 100%, he said that he didn't really talk as much as he would have liked to have done about energy efficiency. And he pointed out that the IEA, the International Energy Agency, say over 40% of future CO2 reductions might be achieved through energy efficiency globally. And let's just remember that's the first fuel. That's the first fuel is energy efficiency. So, you know, as we get more clever and intelligent, uh, you know, electricity grids, we can use that technology to, to reduce waste. And the, the benefits are absolutely enormous. Sometimes they, they don't like make profits like a like an oil company seems to be making at the moment, but they're good investment returns and they're very, very solid and very, very low risk. So, you know, ultimately, I'm, I'm an enormous fan of Kingsmill and I think that he, he speaks with such clarity and force about this pivotal issue narcissism. Society. Um, my only small desire is to clone him. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I agree. He did. A, he did a great job standing up to our uh, premeditated pressure. We did think ahead of time that we would put him under pressure. So um, you you definitely did a great job there, Paul. But I think King's Mill did an even greater job in, in coming at us back and putting out the very good arguments that he put out. Um, I, I just wanted to come back to the sense or the reality, actually, that renewable energies are intermittent. Yes, they are, because as we know, sun, wind, et cetera, et cetera, rain, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm surprised that um, we haven't used the same questioning concept for the price of fossil fuels. The price of fossil fuels is also intermittent. It goes up and down, up oh and down, God. up and down yeah. constantly. And, and we've known that for decades, right? And so, you know, I mean, we, we, we talk about that as being unpredictable, but I wonder if calling them and recognizing them as being intermittent wouldn't in some way um, level the playing field so that we understand what we are really comparing here. Yeah, that's a great point. The intermittency of fossil fuels, you know, which is only overcome by enormous infrastructure investment to try to level the price and massively complicated tax structures, which actually would be perfectly, you know, if we, if it would be a much more level playing field if we deploy the same tools to support renewable development. But of course, we haven't done that yet. The strategic petroleum reserve, you know, like millions of barrels of oil all lo locked up in mountains. I mean, you know, we, we, we do do yeah. that with oil as yeah. well. No, I agree with you. I think he's enormously, and, I, I, and it's just so wonderful talking to somebody who's thought so deeply about this issue and kind of like makes anybody who takes a different perspective feel like they just haven't understood the data. And so yep. I agree with you. He's incredibly useful and powerful spokesperson to be out there in the world pushing this message, which I think is really resonating. I think if I was to pick up an area that I would love to see further developed, I do think that, you know, the impact of a transformation of this type is going to have, um, and he agreed with this, but I think it goes even further than than he allowed, um, just vast political swings that could lead to really peculiar types of leaders emerging yes. all over the world, as we've already seen, right? And that could derail this in all sorts of ways. So it's not that just, you know, prices change and the world flips because it's logical. That might be true when viewed through generational time, but when viewed through the lens of this decisive decade and the next decisive decade, then actually all it would take is like two or three 
you know, stickers of Biden at the pump in a particular election cycle that flips it back to Trump, you know, pulls out the Paris Agreement, abandons everything, resubsidizes fossil fuels. And we're in this crazy world where politics has intervened in an energy transition in a manner that makes it highly complicated. So I love the clarity of his vision, but I'm just concerned the politics could really screw this up for us. Mm. Yeah. And on that political point, I mean, I think once again, you know, we talked about this a lot before, but it is time for, for you know, more of a government information campaign. We actually have a global energy crisis right now. It's a perfect time to begin a real public debate regarding the future of our energy provision. And I think that would be a great way to bring people together around these issues and sort of think about the solutions. And by the way, if I can just revisit a point that we were discussing last week about these Supreme Court judges who oppose environmental protection, who are against protecting people, and they call them conservative. I've decided that they're going to be called militant anti-science judges, and we're not going to call them conservative judges. We're going to call them militant anti-science judges. And what they're doing in, for example, the US Supreme Court, exposing the whole great nation, the great republic of the United States to apocalyptic risk is beyond my comprehension. I know that uh, I'm not suggesting that we summon the outrage and optimism gang to go to the Supreme Court and storm it like Trump told there's other people to do, but we'll have to think of something. In completely other news, I mean, today we're recording this Tuesday, the 3rd of May. I mean, you know, we're in, we're through the looking glass with the Supreme Court with the news that they're, you know, on the cusp of rolling back Roe v. Wade to make abortion um, probably Ill- immediately illegal in 22 states. I mean, it's an alternative issue, but my God, it's 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 really holding us back. In all Time sorts to of get ways. your Handmaid's Tale uh, outfit on and 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 notice that Margaret Atwood did actually predict the future of the world. Do you have a Handmaid's Tale outfit, Paul? I do actually. It's kind of cool. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. very hard to get that thing to curve right, but yeah. I have a box that I keep in. Okay. <laughs> so to bring us back quickly to um, to fossil fuels, if I may, we got a very very thoughtful message from a listener, Hugh Richards, yes. um, who, in a very thoughtful message, wrote to us asking if there is any conversation uh, initiative project to put together a uh, non-fossil fuel treaty from the consumer side, from the demand side. So first of all, Hugh, thank you very much for writing to us. Thank you for your thoughtful uh, message and communication to us. I don't know about Tom and Paul. I don't know of any effort on, on that side, on the consumer side, but I would be happy to know if either of you know What strikes me is that uh, we have, Tom and Paul, we have talked about bringing the non-proliferation treaty effort that is underway, but from a production side, right, Um, bringing those voices to the podcast. And I think we just might be there where we should really accelerate that and bring in onto the pod. Great idea. Yeah, hundred percent. That that non, that fossil fuel non proliferation treaty is genius. Do either of you know? Do you do either of you know uh, if we can give Hugh a better answer? Is there any effort at doing a uh, treaty from the consumer side? I don't know about a treaty. Um, I'm actually at a, a, a wonderful conference in beloved Fintorn where there's a wonderful person f- uh, looking at the role of advertising in in promoting excessive uh, consumption of fossil fuels and seeing how the advertising industry can get together and say, we're not going to promote uh, high carbon products, we're going to promote low carbon products. So that's that's one angle on it. But I think, yeah, the sovereign in the system is actually the citizen, as she or he invests their money and spends their money, that actually controls our whole society. So that is exactly where we need to intervene. And, and there are, yeah, there are lots of people doing stuff. And let's, you know, let's try and do a series about that. Mm. It, it strikes me also that the whole divestment movement is part of that, uh, where where certainly institutions, but individuals, pension owners, um, are divesting incre- increasingly from fossil fuels. So that is part of the, let's say, the consumer side action, um, yep. as well as all of the behavior changes. We we see so much more. Um, demand for vegetarian options, for vegan options. If you want to go to the food 
we uh, we see that the orders for electric vehicles has gone through the roof, a long, long waiting list because people are just so fed up with the price of gas at the pump. So I think it is not a centralized effort to respond yeah. to you. It's not, I don't think there's a centralized effort, but I think there is quite a bit going on, if you want to call it in a decentralized fashion, where consumers and in fact, even institutions are separating themselves from their traditional thoughtless consumption of fossil fuels and doing uh, taking action that is more thoughtful and meaningful. Yeah, and just a tiny bit of reframing. There's that. There's a uh, many people have spoken about this, but John Alexander in particular, reframing people not as consumers but as citizens, because a consumer goes on a sort of whole bit of economic, you know, rationale. A citizen is capable of acting with courage, uh, with, with with empathy, and and with 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 a sort of a, the gr- with the greater good in mind. It's a great point. He's written a very good book. We should have him on the podcast. Let's do that. Excellent. Right. Okay. Any more comments from either of you or shall we uh, move on? Okay. All done for this week. Amazing. Thank you, everybody, for joining us as ever. And thank you very much for writing in. If anyone has answers to that question that we just put out there, then do let us know. And thank you. We always appreciate hearing from you. We will leave you as ever with a piece of music. Here is Stelios Vasiludis with End Transmission. Bye. Bye. Hi, this is Stelios Vasiludis, and the song I'm presenting is called End Transmission. What initially inspired me to write this piece of music was an allegorical story I imagined. A lone survivor in a missile silo or bomb shelter searching for contact after an extinction level catastrophe. Two years ago, as the events of the pandemic unfolded, the feeling of isolation and despair I was trying to express became more tangible. Our plight was and is self-made. It is an inescapable fact that our insatiable and callous behavior as a species is directly responsible for the disruption of the very ecosystems we depend on to survive. The important work of researchers such as Stuart Pym, Andy Dobson, and James Wood, who have presented evidence that loss of biodiversity enables rapid spread of new diseases from animals to humans, inspired me to embed a more broad and urgent message.
There you go. Another episode of Outrage and Optimism. My name is Clay. I'm the producer of this podcast. And my message to you is very simple. Thank you for listening. The track that you just heard was End Transmission by Stelios Vasiloudis. And Stelios Vasiloudis is really fun to say. Um, He has an album full of songs just like the one you heard. Cinematic, harmonically dense, aformulaic in structure, and... I went and listened to a few of them. They're great. I love playing this music when I need to reflect on something, you know, sit in some thoughts or just kind of rest my mind a little bit. And so feel free to do the same. He just released a new album uh, titled All Else Fails that you can go listen to and watch visuals for um, on YouTube. So go check it out. Speaking of great music, just a reminder to our audience that the Environmental Music Prize is still open for voting. So you can go listen to music, vote for your favorites, promote environmentalism, and bringing environmental music into the mainstream. Go to environmentalmusicprize.com. And if you're wondering, Clay, what is an Environmental Music Prize? Uh, Two episodes back in our feed is an entire episode where Christiana and I speak with the founder of the prize, Edwina Flock, about this effort to get environmental music elevated uh, to mainstream music status. So that effort is happening right now and you only have a limited time to take part. So go to the website because voting is going to end soon. Again, that's environmentalmusicprize.org. Click the link in the show notes of your podcast player and vote away. All right. Thank you so much to our guest this week, Kingsmill Bond. And if you were wondering, yes, I did say, hello, Mr. Bond, I've been expecting you when he arrived at our recording session. So, you know, how could I not? Uh, Kingsmill's article titled How Putin's War Marks the End of the Fossil Fuel Era is a great short read. Um, I'm not an extraordinarily proficient reader, so I really appreciated a complex topic uh, having such uh, human readability. So link is below. Take a few minutes to give it a read and also go ahead and follow RMI's socials and Mr. Bond's socials and Mr. Bond's socials in the show notes. Thank you, Kingsmill, for coming on. Last week, our production team here at Outrage and Optimism put a link to a Twitter thread of crowdsourced resources to deal with climate anxiety that was started by Elena Wood. And this week, don't worry, we're not sending you back to Twitter. Uh, This week, another recommendation from our team, the Climate Change and Happiness Podcast. It's a podcast for people around the globe who are thinking deeply about the personal side of climate change and in particular, their emotional responses and their feelings. Uh, It's hosted by Dr. Thomas J. Doherty, a Portland psychologist who specializes in climate. And the latest episode is with Britt Ray, who just released a book getting high praise from several former guests on this podcast, Uh, Dr. Catherine Wilkinson, Adam McKay, David Wallace-Wells. So take some time for yourself and read up on the book. It's called Generation Dread. And the podcast, again, is called The Climate Change and Happiness Podcast. But you don't need to memorize that because you can just click a link in the show notes. We got you. Yes, if you like this podcast, please give us a rating on Apple Podcasts and write a review because we read every single one and, you know, selfishly, we kind of enjoy it. And we have social media because who doesn't? At Outrage Optimism is where you can find us. Give us a follow to stay up to date on all things outrageous and optimistic on climate. Big sip of water. Okay, stay hydrated and thank you for listening and be sure to hit follow or subscribe and we'll see you right back here next week. Bye.